was quite early that I was pointed more or less in the, in the directions uh, where my life projects has been located. That was one Tibet, the Himalaya region. That came up because in my early school, when, when I was in primary school, I saw a lecture as a student of Heinrich Harrer, seven years in Tibet, and that impressed me a lot. That was, and there were some other books on Tibet because it was a forbidden country, so it created a kind of image and a desire to travel to Tibet to see this place with my own. The other thing was the pure wilderness, which challenged me. I wanted to expose myself in pure wilderness to have a chance to uh, be on your own, to live 100% self-responsibility. I thought, I felt that might be a very valuable experience for me. And the third was a cultural topic that was the Silk Road because it was such a childhood dream, a legendary intercontinental uh, way, Marco Polo, also this I did know. And uh, Tibet, of course, was, was the very first. I, I had a chance to go there. Mount Kailash in Tibet is a very, very, very special place. It's, from my point of view, unique. And this is the reason why I come and come again and again, every year at least one time. I came for the very first time in 1987 to the Mount Kailash. At that time you just could not book a, a budget trip like it is nowadays the, of the case. At that time it was very, very difficult to reach Mount Kailash. I wanted to go there because it is regarded as the most holy place in the world, as a real power place. And I wanted just to feel how do I feel there in this area. What is the energy there? I wanted to experience this myself. And when I came there for the first time, I, I felt this strong energy there. This it was inspiring for me. I saw the devotion of the pilgrims who come from hundreds of miles, some walking, some crawling, prostrating. Uh, I saw in their faces and uh, I felt that this place is really unique and I never have seen anything else. Then I started, of course, to be interested in why it became such a holy place. What is the holy on Mount Kailash? Is it the mountain itself? The shape of the mountain, the rock, the ice, the material? No, it is the people. It is the pilgrims who create this energy, who create this field which, is, which you can feel. You get emotional into that, you tune in in this energy because everybody of this pilgrim comes there with the noblest ideas and wishes they have in, in their luggage and they come there to exchange themselves with this mountain. And, and this, is, this creates this special aura, this special field there from year to year. I saw that in different levels of this mountain. First, I was interacted in the outside and in pilgrims and so on. Later on, I realized that the, the, the Tibetan yogis, since decades, they came there to meditate. I realized that this is, is a natural mandala, a cosmic diagram, and the nature fits perfectly. It is the mountain in the middle, in the center. It are two lakes in front of the Mount Kailash, and there are sources of four major rivers, who, which, which uh, have their sources on four sides of the mountain and flow in four directions. This is fantastic. A mandala has four gates. The Mount Kailash has the four sources, which function as the four entrance gate. And then I started to become a pilgrim and to go into this mandala as a pilgrim, that means to enter the mandala in the eastern gate, to follow the clockwise circle from outside to inside. And at the end, I, I, as I went along this mountain 30 times on the pilgrim way. I went more uh, sometimes into the so-called inner core, in the innermost of the mandala. So I learned to know this mountain. And now I am convinced that originally, the mountain attracted people from different cultures, from different religions, because on this Mount Kailash, four of the most important rivers have their sources. And they, can't, they bring the life, they bring the water, where millions and millions of people live. So these were the very early, the, the original 
um, uh, attraction to people. They climbed up, they wanted to worship, they wanted to give their thanks for their lifehood, for the water, for this essence of life. And they, then they saw this mountain. And that's why this, the Mount Kailash is in the center of religious worship of four major Asian religions. Not only the Buddhists, it's the Hindus, it's the Chinas, and it's the shamans, that means the shamanic burn religion, which was earlier there than the Buddhists in Tibet. My personal relationship with Buddhism is, uh, is uh, that I feel attracted to Buddhism because I have seen Buddhism, how it is lived, not that theory, not the teachings, the theoretical thing, how it is lived. I came to places like Burma and I felt there that the people live an altruistic spirit every day, every day. They know that it is important to give first and not to expect something. We are world champions in expectations. We expect every day lots of things from others, rarely from ourselves. And this altruistic spirit was one thing. The other thing what attracted me on Buddhism was that I experienced myself similar truths. Like when I was in the desert on my own, I realized the power of the thoughts of the spiritual, that the spirit is moving the physical body and not opposite around. I have one really very big dream, vision, which becomes already in reality uh, for the future, to make a, a really big journey along the Silk Road. I have dealt with these topics previously, I wrote even books, but it was following the ancient uh, roots of the Silk Road and to deal with the culture. But now I'm interested in the spirit of the ancient Silk Road. What can we nowadays in the 20th century learn from the ancient Silk Road? The Silk Road is past, but the multicultural spirit and the religious tolerance of the Silk Road is more needed than ever. This is what we can learn. And this message I want to bring forward in a spectacular action, in a real road uh, expedition from Brussels to Shanghai, in a special moment in the year 2010, when, the, when for the very first time the Expo, the World Exhibition, will be in Shanghai, in the most modern city in China. And uh, then I will make this trip with conferences along the road in so-called acupuncture points, conferences on the political vision of the New Silk Road, conferences on environment and development, conferences on intercultural dialogue, on art in Venice, interreligious dialogue in Istanbul. So selected places along the road with a, with a music ensemble who is performing a Silk Road program, which, which the music ensemble itself have these multicultural personalities. And this will be end at the Expo, we are, the UNESCO will be the the uh, patronage for this, uh, for this road of dialogue, like I call it. Uh, the European Union will give us the platform at the World Exhibition to have an own pavilion there for the project. So this is for me now the, the most important thing I'm working on. I have seen a lot in the world. There are nowadays a lot of problems. They seem overwhelming us climate change, political problems, intolerance, and so on. It could make, or it could rob the hope. It could make you desperate. But I always in my life saw problems at the same time as chances. And um, I am convinced that we have the power, that we can change, and we have the choices. And therefore, it is very, very important for everybody to take action, to interfere, to, to try to contribute. And a lot of people say, I cannot do anything, I'm very small, I'm just one person. This is wrong. Our, our spirit is unlimited and is very, very powerful. We can create a lot. The Buddha, as the Buddha said, fool, recognize yourself. If you can recognize yourself, you have the chance to do something and to bring your input, your personal, and to do your personal responsibility. This is very, very important for the future.